minutes late, I promise to make it great. Hi, I'm Tim. Welcome to Watchbox Studios. I'm here with my friend Armin Johnston. Welcome to the show, Armin. Thank you. We've got a hell of a show tonight. It's a little bit of a different format. We're going to mix it up. we got some live watches, live chat, our most interactive program ever. But let me remind you that we have a pop-up shop if you're going to be in Geneva for the auctions this coming week. Hotel de Berg. You could see the landmark, we're right there. There's our number, our Swiss office can give you advance notice of the inventory on hand. Let the questions begin. These are watches you can try before you buy. A wonderful alternative to auction season. Armand, what are you wearing today? I am wearing a Volcane Cricket, actually. This L is me, a recent acquisition. Let me model that for you. Yeah, please. Okay. So let me, let me ask, why'd you buy? You know, uh, an alarm function is something I've always wanted, or rather an alarm complication. And uh, the Volcane's one of the, the more, uh, kind of one of the more historical alarm pieces. And I, I just, I love it. I saw it, it came in at the right price. I couldn't, couldn't leave without it. Now you're absolutely right. And they did beat JLC to market by about 18 months. So that will burn them forever. I know Volcane, of course, back on its feet. The original alarm watch, or at least the original functional alarm watch. This thing requires a little bit of an understanding of mechanical engineering to operate because rather than two crowns like JLC, you have one crown and a clutch system. And I'm going to defer to Armand on how well that works, but it is a brilliantly executed machine. And the tradition of the original Didesheim family Volcane, beautifully executed on the case back in a wonderful limited edition version, I think. It is, yeah. You know, one of the things the uh, most, uh, Tim kind of showcased the movement a little bit. It, it To me, the finishing looks utilitarian, and for a watch like this, for some reason, that makes sense to me. I just, it's it's a watch that you, you, you will use every day, potentially. Yeah, it was considered to be a little bit of like a watch of the people. The alarm watch was always kind of a mid-market complication. It was never a perpetual calendar, a split second. It was never also as democratic as something like a date but it was always considered to be a very practical traveler type complication, and I dig that. It is, it is practical, and, it, and it's fun too. It, it's one of those things where I'll, I'll just, I'll leave it on my desk at work and I'll, I'll set the alarm for 10 of six. Now guys, I gotta explain why have I been gone two weeks. I am heading to Singapore, where I am gonna be meeting with you guys all of next week at our Singapore location, so I wanna promote that before we go any further in. I've been preparing for my trip abroad. I'm gonna be heading from Singapore to Dubai for watch week, so I'm making it a circumnavigation. I'll be back on this show sometime in early December, so it's gonna be one heck of a haul, but I wanna see you along the way. Let me show you what I'm wearing. Quick wrist shot, you guys know me, EZM 1.1. And the timepiece on my wrist, part of a 500-piece series from 2017, the watch is singular. A reverse chrono with a radial 60-minute indicator. They basically took a Valju 7750, they turned it into the SC01, and they made it look like a Lamagna 5100, which means central radial minutes, no hour register, bi-directional rotating bezel, and of course, this one is tegmented, so it's basically indestructible. Not the only watch on the table tonight, it's a little bit of the Watch Insider and Monday Mailbag Hybrid. Let me call out our friend Friends, Russell996, Vegas Milgaus, Andrew, Matt Foster, Eddie Landsberg, longtime friend, Joseph Folk, Pilot Style123, joining in from Ireland. We've got Neo, James Smith, Thomas Burnett, Hale Bop, Slayer Rock, Forever. Greeting <laughs> Armand, Slayer. Is, is on your side, Armand. All right. Big fans from South Florida and Richard Combe and Pedro from Portugal. Welcome, everyone. John claude Beaver. We've got Captain <laughs> Zed. We've got Edward Ledden of Sweden, Brad Coates, Judson Van Meter, Mark S., and Alexi Simola of Finland. Guys, welcome, and welcome aboard. We are taking questions. We got a question from Monkey Sea Production. Tim, are you planning to get a Christmas watch? I'm thinking about it. To mark my world tour, I might pick up some sort of watch to commemorate the occasion. So we're going to have to see what the Singapore office has. But if I were to pick a watch off the table tonight, it would probably be this. 250-piece Platinum Limited Edition Master Compressor Memovox from 2002. This thing is sublime. 41.5 millimeters. The blue dial was way ahead of the curve back in 2002. Caliber 918 automatic. It's the Memovox internally. It's a diver on the outside. Shades of the Polaris 68 in the dial. And of course, this one too features a bi-directional rotating inner dive bezel. Because I know you're going to want to hear it speak for itself, and because it can, I'm going to fire up the alarm. It's almost unfair to show an alarm watch. I, I feel bad with the Volcane already. <laughs> yeah, the Volcane already pales in comparison. Well, this is an incredible alarm because it's so vocal. And the thing I love about JLC is since the... I love that. 
since the Grand Revive of 1989, they've nailed the alarm. There are other alarms that are more sophisticated. There are other alarms that give you more setting modes. And there are other alarms that are louder, but I can't think of one that's more sonorous. You know what? Let Especially me in a platinum case. Yeah. Why don't I, I'm going to ask you to wrist model this because people know my wrist size. I'm 16 centimeters. Armin, how big is your wrist? I have just, just south of a 7-inch wrist, and I'm about 17.5 centimeters. Oh, right. Now, here's we have a question. Are you going to throw it? Well, no, not really, because this isn't the compressor extreme. That one has the shock-resistant case. This one is cased <laughs> in platinum, and 41.5, it doesn't have any extra room in there for shock absorbers. But a lovely watch, and again, I can't think of a more versatile piece for traveling. The combination of the ability to swim with it, the alarm, the fact that the alarm can wake you up, and the mass of the damn thing in platinum. Also, the fact, let me quickly steal this away from you, that it has a full platinum clasp. JLC stopped doing this in 2006. JLC, why? Please, more like this. <laughs> All right. Armand, the first question of the night. Yeah. What comes after the Nautilus? We, we are at peak Nautilus, maybe just past. You're seeing a little bit maybe of a softening of prices? Yeah, there's a bit of a softening. I think uh, the holiday season is going to firm up the pricing pricing back up, actually. But I think, you know, shortly after the holiday wave goes goes by, we're going to see a bit more softening just because, you know, we've seen a few more Nautilus's ship. Um, and it's, it's kind of nice to see you can deliver it a little bit more often, which is not something that you usually can do. Yeah, that's an interesting point. We think there is going to be a little bit more production. I would also say... At some point, fatigue sets in for every trend, and my example is supercars. You always see a bumper crop of supercars at the end of the economic cycle. Right before the bust, that is when you're going to see the 1,000 horsepower, four-wheel drive, four-cam, five-valve, V16 monster machine. And, you know, you know it's true. We're seeing more of the Nautilus on Chrono, on eBay, on vendor pages. And obviously we have interest because we sell the watch, but I've got to be honest. I think we're a little bit burned out on the 5711. So what style of watch? do you think could even fill this gap? Because I think we will burn out as a collective well, community on You know, this. I think the, the Nautilus in general is enigmatic as a sports watch in that it is extremely, it's extremely refined and refined to the point where it's almost, you don't feel like it's a sports watch when it's on the wrist, especially the 5711 because it is a, a, a very thin, Watch true, in compared general. to like the 5726, which feels like a brick. feels Or the 5980, which feels a little thicker. And, uh, you know, it just feels a little bit too delicate to me to really be a sports watch. What I think we're going to see moving forward is more of the mix between, uh, mix between dress and sport. I think okay. something that's, you know, maybe a little bit less uh, sporty than, you know, a... a um, a Royal Oak, okay. but a little bit more dressy than something that's on an alligator strap. I think somewhere in the between, we're going to see actually probably a really cool range of watches that come out. I'm really personally pulling for, discussing Paddock in particular, pulling for a kind of more modern Calatrava lineup. Okay, I could see that, and that is true. Patek really does need to look at the Calatravas. You've seen what they've redesigned in the last couple of years. There's been a bumper crop of new Aquanauts over the last three seasons. We've seen all sorts of complications. There's a new chronograph to mm -hmm. replace the 5170. The Nautilus has seen several iterations and special editions and even a movement upgrade this year. Which was surprising and relatively quiet. Yeah, it was kind of a soft launch. Well, I guess they don't need any more orders. <laughs> But, but yeah, I'm thinking, and we have a question from Mark S. Tim, what are shock absorbers? As they relate to the Master Compressor Extreme, there are literally two pieces to the case. The outside is steel, the inside is titanium, and there are springs, so you can basically destroy the thing. You can go out and play golf with that watch. You'll be fine. People did it at the launch of the model. They were all fine. But do you think there's going to be a change in preferences for straps over integrated bracelets? Or... Are bracelets just here to stay on yeah. every model? Is there any exception? I I don't personally like integrated bracelets because I like the option of having a strap. I like the option of putting a calf leather strap on something, or even a NATO sometimes. I mean, I, I went through a NATO phase personally, and uh, I'm a bit over it myself now. I'm more of a bracelet guy, but recently I have been getting into rubber straps. And something with an integrated bracelet is just a little less attractive to me. You know, that's why I think... Um, that's why I think Rolex as a sports model, as a sports watch in general, is fantastic because it looks great on rubber or. Yeah. or uh, if you're steel. bold enough to throw your Rolex on like an Everest or a rubber B, they do look great. Take they my do. word for it. But and uh, I think uh, the NATO. 
Sorry oh, about that. No, that's good. <laughs> now we get to hear the volcano. A little bit different. <laughs> Yeah, I think the NATO thing, the NATO craze, um, maybe has come and gone a little bit. I, th I see it less and less, but that is always a good alternative to something uh, like rubber, and it's kind of the double secure. So now here's the thing: we clearly do see phases of taste because if you remember the 2000s, everyone was throwing the watch on a rubber strap. The rubber strap was the cliche of the 2000s, along with things that were just frankly too big. The rubber strap was on everything, and. In the early 2000s, the NATO was on everything. Now people are all about integrated bracelets, not just like Rolex style watch bracelet pairings, but bracelets that are integrated into the lug profile. And that's a little bit more permanent, Yeah. but I also think it's a fad. Well, that's a that's a classic, uh, you know, Genta design in general is an integrated bracelet. You have your Engineer, your Nautilus, your Royal Oak, um, Geez, blanking on anything else with an integrated bracelet, but I know there's a fourth one. The, the show part Alpine Eagle. <laughs> oh, no. You get your VCC 222, like your Laureato, like yep. those classic watches. Laureato, that's it. Yep. But here's the other thing. I can see this coming to a close because at some point it's going to appear like a cliche as opposed to a, as, as opposed I think to it's a hot turning button. into that. Uh, speaking of the show part Alpine Eagle, <laughs> okay, has anyone done a good job of emulating the traditional? integrated bracelet brands without embarrassing themselves. Like clearly you've got IWC, which has for some reason abandoned the Genta and yeah, at completely. the worst possible time, but you've got Patek, you've got the Royal Oak. Who has done the best job of riding the wave without crashing and burning? Other than Patek and the, well, other than has the Has anyone and Royal come Oak? out with an integrated bracelet sports watch since this became overplayed that has not been plainly a Me Too watch? Is anyone doing no, a good job? No, but I like the Laureato. I actually do like the Laureato, uh, the newer one. And and some of the older generation ones, I actually think the newer one kind of cut a little bit of originality, but it's to ride the wave. And I, I do even still like the newer one. I think it's actually worth looking back at the Laureato from the 2010s. And uh, like the Laureato Evo 3 was a really cool watch that was legitimately from a brand that had been doing this for four decades. That watch, I think, has a lot of value, and I could see people coming back to those. I think the stuff like the BR-05 and the Alpine Eagle, and frankly, even the Longa Odysseus, are just going to wind up being really discounted used watches. I, I couldn't agree more. I think the BR-05 is, is in itself, and I, I like Bell & Ross, don't get me wrong. The BR-05 in itself represents the problem with the industry, in my opinion. Yeah. And, it, and it's just, it's more of the same, and you know, you, you see... You see white metal blue dial pieces like this this JLC. Yes. And it's uncomparable. It's amazing in comparison to any almost any blue dial white metal piece that we see coming out in the past you know little over a year. It's uh, it's outrageous. You know, it's interesting that we talk about some of these non-native designs coming from brands that have no business wasting their time on a Genta style watch. Let's talk about something that Chopard actually did right. Let's talk about an LUC Tech Twist, and this is the kind of watch that Chopard, at the manufacturer level, does well. It's still Swiss engineering, Swiss finishing, Swiss craft watch tradition out of Fleurier, but the watch doesn't look staid. It doesn't look establishment. Everything about this watch is almost ironic because it's high horology and truly highest level horology, but it's not conservative. It's not establishment. It's not something that I would describe as a, a cliche riffing on Patek or Vacheron or the majors in the dress watch segment. What do you think about this timepiece? I mean, hugely underrated brand. Is this like one of the ultimate pre-owned buys? This is, this is the pre-owned buy. I think we have this I think we have this listed just south of 10,000, which is to me is outrageous. It's it's effectively a three-step dial uh, for the first, and right uh, right when you look at it, you have the sub seconds track and a really actually a, a nice clean way to display the date. It might not be the most legible date, but it is legible enough and it's hidden at a glance, which I like. And of course, the hour track is fantastic in the with the blued blued base in general. Yeah, and the little the little nods and winks here, of course, Carl Friedrich Schäufele of Chopard, a big gearhead. You can see there's almost a gear-like notching of the outer face. The tech twist plays hugely on automotive imagery, and it's kind of kinship between Schäufele and people who love cars. Chopard, longtime sponsor of the Mille Millia, and a little bit of that has found its way into this watch. It's the same kind of fascination that you get when you pop open the hood, you know, 
22 karat white gold micro rotor. You've got a 65 hour power reserve, twin stacked barrels, manufacture movement. Throw it on the wrist. It's a perfect size. It's neither large nor small. And the off centered crown gives it a little bit of a sporting appearance, something you'd expect to see on a pure sports style watch. It's an offbeat dress watch to be sure, but it is a dress watch. Mm -hmm. I'm hoping something like that can catch on post. I think something like this is, is cool too, because if you're in the same room with another person wearing this watch, you're probably in the right room. You know, it, this is not something that you'll ever really see in the wild, and there's something very cool about that. And you pair it, you have a 22, 22 karat white gold micro rotor that actually is partially visible through the dial itself. It's That's true, you can see the winding mass so moving through cool. the dial. That's my favorite, favorite part about the watch, actually, and I'm, this was one of my picks. I can't even get over it. You can see the small, um, well, the other side yeah, of the micro rotor right little, next to the show that That little trilobe just under my finger that's spinning away on the dial side. Now, here's the thing. We do see watches that are transformational. I would say the most influential design of the last decade is, without a doubt, the PAM382, the original Bronzo. That is patient zero for the entire bronze watch trend, which proves yeah. that you can have a breakthrough. Someone can do something truly new. Do you see any potential for any of the watches that came out this year to be that influential? <laughs> That's really, really tough to say. Honestly, I'm... The watches coming out now, I, I struggle to... I struggle to see the, the real staying, staying power behind a lot of them. It's almost like the... It's almost like the car industry right now. Like, I don't really see a lot of things that are being released coming out that I'm going to want in 40 years or that are still going to be cool in 40 years or even usable. Yeah. Um, that's got a little bit different with the Swiss watch industry. I, I'm going to go out on a limb and say I think the new Corvette's pretty hot. I agree with that. That's a cool, that, yes, I agree with that entirely. But uh, I, I just think there's, there's not a lot of, there's not a lot of new coming out. And it, it's worrisome because you, wor you wonder what are these brands going to do? You know, you have, you have brands like AP and the, the Royal Oak really carrying the brand almost entirely, Royal Oak and the Royal Oak Offshore. Speaking, Speaking of Royal of, Oak, this was an example of a watch that was a pace setter, a design trend that went strong for about a decade. The forged carbon look, this was the Bumblebee launched in 2009. This was a very influential watch, but again, like you said, here we are 10 years from the launch of this watch, and AP is still struggling to succeed with anything that doesn't have an eight-sided bezel. Well, Scratch that. They now have an eight-sided <laughs> bezel on a watch that didn't succeed. But anything that's not a Royal Oak, they're, they're struggling to find what's next. And, you know, it, it's interesting seeing that from a company like AP because up until, geez, up until the 70s, you know, they had a lot of high horology. They had your perpetual calendars, minute repeaters. And up until, geez, uh, I want to say 69, they, they'd made it only the double digits on some of their perpetual calendars and uh, I think a couple of their chronos actually with complicated calendars, which is really interesting because you think if you have the the wherewithal and the know-how to do that, you, you make more, but I guess their production was significantly less at that time. Since we don't have real-time graphics, I'm gonna give a quick shout out to one thing AP did right recently. I don't know if you've seen the Bolshoi Theater limited edition uh, version of the Audemars Piguet 1159. I've often said that if you took the enamel fade dial from the complications and put it on the standard watch, you'd have a damn good looking watch. And that's, that's exactly what they wound up with. The it problem? Is. It's a three-hand date, 41 millimeter, that costs $41,000. So you're paying $1,000 per millimeter, and it's difficult to rationalize in a world where 41,000 is a chunk of change. <laughs> and you know, I, I still I still see a problem with the date placement on on that piece. That with that dial, there should be no date. There should be no outcut. It's it's too beautiful a dial to cut up, in my opinion. And I I, I do like the watch very much. I would just like it much more without a date. I mean, it's, it seems like everyone asks for watches without dates. The question is, does anyone actually buy them? It's like, it's like manual <laughs> transmission Ferraris. Everyone wants them on the secondary circuit, but the guys who buy these things new never write the check, which is why they're now extinct. Would people buy watches without date? Can you think of I don't know other if anybody's buying the 1159 anyway. Well, yeah, that's true. <laughs> well, that's, they're, sure, they're buying it. They're buying it at list so they can get to the short list for the Royal Oaks. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> you buy the one, you get the other. I hate to say it. There is a lot of conditional selling going on. 
Yeah, longa. That's how you're gonna move a couple of longa ones. But look, I'll be honest, I had a question. Someone asked me what I thought of the Odysseus. It's a good product. It's a competent product that's properly priced. It's going to give you everything I think we wish the Nautilus was. It has an intelligently designed modular bracelet that's fully sizable, every link removable with a quick release system. It has an adjustable slider inside its clasp. AP, Patek, why are you not doing this? It's got an extended power reserve that's more than any Nautilus, and I think it's worth mentioning that it's also got a 120 meter water resistant that makes it more water resistant than the 15, 400, 500, 300, 202. <laughs> so it's offering everything we said we wanted. And well, you it know, looks it's like a longa. It it's doesn't funny, look actually, like a Royal Oak. Paddock actually recently did update their clasps to have the quick adjust, but it's nowhere near the seven. I believe that in the clasp of the longa, there's the, the seven seven adjust or rather seven way adjustment. It, it, unfortunately, uh, this is where you realize that everyone has the same suppliers in the industry. It's the same BN based supplier that provides the clasp for your IWC pilot. Now that we know still Patek, why don't you just give those guys a call? It would be great. I, I actually, endorse. I like Paddock's new, um, new adjustment. It's just a quick pull on yeah. the new 5726. It's like the overseas. Exactly. Exactly. Speaking of which, we had a question from the field. Why hasn't the current overseas been a bigger hit? Oh, I, I have opinions on this one. I think the Gen 2 overseas was amazing. I think the quick quick release options and the strap options of the Gen 3 are incredible, but I think they got the proportions wrong. This is, this is in my opinion, the the date just two of the overseas. You know, the proportions oh, are just a okay. little bit off, okay? It's 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 a little bit, um, it feels a little bit chunky. It, it feels like the bezel's just slightly off. And in my opinion, the center link is far too thin. It's just, just off enough for me to just look at the Gen 2 and really not understand where the Gen 3 came from. Now, here's the thing. I, I know exactly what you mean about the bezel, and I agree with you about the overseas having a bezel issue. And here's the root of the problem. I'm gonna pull up, it's great, I, I search overseas 5500 on, on Google, I immediately get a picture of my own wrist. But if you look, and, and I'm not, that's not boasting, that's just me spamming myself. So open image in a new window. Let's take a look at an overseas. In my opinion, right one of the best too. One of my favorite dial configurations. So okay, so we've got a picture of the bezel of the watch, and here's the issue you've got right here. There is a plinth underneath the bezel. There is this circular ring underneath the bezel itself. So instead of the bezel sitting flush with the case, the bezel is sitting on top of a plinth that, that is sitting on top of the case. That's a hell of an observation. I did not realize that. Yeah, so you've got this extra piece of metal that has no business being there, <laughs> and, and I really don't know what the purpose is other than, well, we need to change something because it's generation three. and. Exhibit B, the absence of the big date. That was a signature of the chrono. They lost that, it lost its pull. And the automatic, the 41 millimeter automatic, in my opinion, became the best overseas when that went away. Yeah, the 41 automatic is fantastic. Actually, the black dial uh, version in particular. I, it, the black dials that Vacheron comes out with are just outrageous. And and this is another uh, fatigue of the blue dial sports craze, I think. I'm, I'm, I kind of... I'm not crazy about the blue dial on the overseas, even though it's, you know, very similar to that of the dial in the Chronometra Blue, just with a, a few less steps. Um, it's just, there's something about it that just misses the mark to me, whereas the black dial version, well, we'll pull so it up here right we go. here. We, we've got the black dial, this, this is so, like, bootleg, and at the same time, <laughs> this is the most interactive the show has ever been. We've got real-time graphics. So you could see that the loss of the double date and the addition of that plinth made the chronograph Oops, look at that. I gotta reconnect my email box. It created an issue with the chronograph in that the watch became visually more bulky, emotionally less charismatic, and I think the self-winding is now by far the most attractive version of the overseas. It's a better size at 41, it's a lot thinner, it's better balanced, and whereas the Generation 2 was basically built on the chronograph, I think today if you want one of these, the best buy, especially for 16 grand used, is yeah. gonna be that automatic. And this, that's actually a really good showcase of that center link just being too small. Uh, there's something that's just misproportioned right there, there and it's... It needs to be a little wider. And here's the thing, it does have like a Rolex Deep Sea Generation 1 issue where you've got a case that looks like it's almost twice oh, as wide yeah. as the bracelet. And so the center link looks even worse because the bracelet's not proportional and the center link looks like it's still sized for the Generation 1 version of this watch. 
So that's the problem right there. This thing looks like it's turgid with water, like you soaked it overnight and it swole excessively. <laughs> Whereas this, well, this is better balanced at least, and on the strap, it looks even better. You can see that the case itself is not as wide, and I would not be shocked if the actual width of the bracelet where it mates with the case is exactly the same, despite the fact that this is a millimeter and a half larger in diameter. I think we just figured out the problem I with think, the Generation yeah. 3. All right. <laughs> so, quick question. I know you're all about this watch, so I'm going to let you present it, or I'll hand model it while you narrate. Get so closer this, to is, uh, this is a newer Breitling Limited Edition, and actually one that I think uh, sticks very hard. This is uh, a, a 1959 Navitimer re-edition, and it's limited edition to, of course, 1959 pieces, which for Breitling is relatively low. And I think the execution's excellent. You know, yeah, it does have that creamy aged loom that is hit or miss. I think they nailed it on this one. I think the uh, the gilt of the wings under Breitling there, I think the, sol the solid case back first and foremost. I... Tim, I'm a sucker for solid case backs. I really am, especially on historical pieces. I'm a believer when it's designed to make the watch true and also designed to make the watch thinner. Now this, of course, is a reference 806 homage. Breitling claims the first one came out in 1952. Most scholars say 1954. But you've got the original AOPA wings because AOPA was a sponsor of the original design in the creation process. You've got the circular slide rule system, which is essentially a very efficient a logarithmic scale multiplication and division device. And then you've got those lovely syringe style hands Hands. And look, no one hates Fotina more than I do, but it just works here. It's handsome, it's emotional, it's gripping, and it's visceral. And you know, the bezel itself is a little bit different too, because this is a bead, a beaded edge bezel rather than uh, uh, a, con, uh, oh, okay. a scallop, yes. a scallop style bezel. And I really like that because it does give it this vintage appeal. And beyond that, you know, the case at 41 millimeters is very true to size, true to form as well. Overall, I think uh, this is, is this the B09 caliber in this? Well, it's gonna be, I think this one in particular is called the B09 and it's an evolution of the B01, exactly. which I love because there are not too many manual wind versions of the B01. And so it's got the vertical clutch, the column wheel, it's got the 70 hour power reserve. It's even got the early, uh, three minute increments for the for long the distance phone. phone. Yeah, the <laughs> long distance billing was three minutes, six minutes, and nine minutes, and that Love original that. index would help you to keep track. I also like the fact that there is no date on the dial because Georges Crenn has done one thing very right with Breitling. He said, when we do historical homage watches, it's gonna be the size and the layout of the original. I don't agree with everything he's done, and I think he's a long way from the turnaround promised, but this at least is what the Schneider family should have been doing 10 years ago with the Breitling brand. And I'll mention, it's not just a beaded bezel, it's a small beaded bezel, which makes it really 1950s authentic and monotone registers up. Oh, I like it. Plexi crystal too. And you know how you can tell if you taste the crystal <laughs> and it's warm, plexiglass. True fact. Or, you know, put it times. under your chin. <laughs> so let or me taste jump, it. Jump back to our live board right here. We are up to $3.99 and flying along. Questions, guys, we are taking them live. Uh, we have Eddie Landsberg asking, Tim, can you do an entry-level independence video, especially for brands that do handcrafted pieces? That's so a cool you're, idea. You're talking like Kadoka, Habring, uh, Pita Bus Barcelona. I think that would be a great feature, and we will do that. You're into smaller independence, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. I think that would be a really cool uh, show idea, actually. That, that could be a collaborative production. Guys in the control room, please put that on the production schedule. Put it in it. it. You heard it here first. <laughs> All right, we've got I Grikos asking, hello from Vegas, Tim and everyone. Happened to be here off topic. I just got my Zin 104 a week ago and love it. Zin brother, you chose right. And I see right here, we've got a whole lot of folks, 400 live, that's a pretty good live showing considering we've been gone for two weeks. Let's see what else you guys are asking. Any Ming fans here? Yes, if you read my GPHG review on Quill and Pad, I picked the Ming 1706 to win the GPHG category. Ming is actually on my short list, uh, personally, in collecting. I, I think they're doing such cool things. Just in terms of case design and dial configuration, I like a clean dial that you know what it is when you look at it. Yeah, Ming Tan's time has come, and I picked the 1706 to win the challenge category. So, fingers crossed, hope he gets it, because no one deserves it more. Uh, let's also talk a little bit about the vintage watch craze. I feel like we're at the crest of three trends that are gonna end. There's the Nautilus look-alike, the bum rush to make a Nugenta watch, there's the bronze watch thing, which 
is still going strong, but I feel ebbing. And then there's the vintage tribute trend, which I feel is intellectually bankrupt and has nowhere to go. I, I'm on board with vintage to no end. Uh, I, the, I think the last time I wore my CK2907, or excuse me, KO2907, so I love vintage. Um, I think really vintage ballooned way too fast and people got on board with it way too quickly and it became more, and, and this is a, you know, an opinion and probably um, something that happens with a lot of hobbies, but it came more about lifestyle than it did actually enjoyment of the pieces and it became about acquisition rather than appreciation. And in my opinion, that's recipe for disaster. Yeah, I'm all about homage, but I think you can remember, guys, there was a time when there were only a handful of companies that did true tribute watches. There was Vacheron with Historique from 1993 onward, there was Omega with the Museum Collection from 2001 onward, and in the mid-2000s, Longines actually led the way with very faithful reproductions. And they have really, co they had really cool offerings. Actually, still in Longines' catalog, there's really cool vintage pieces in the vintage collection, and that has, that's everything from countdown timers, that's true to form, really cool, wearable, modern vintage. And some of them have been way out there, like the Mono Pusher Chronos, the size of my fist. Like, they've really gone out there outside the mainstream, so it's not just a pure product play for volume. They've done some stuff that is so obscure, even I have to look it up and figure out what the hell they're talking <laughs> about. I'm like, okay, this Longine, I love you, but like, I don't have access to your archive. I have no idea where this came from. I really do think there was a time when it felt super special, when you had that one Omega Museum watch per year. Occasionally, Vacheron would bring back one of their all-time greats. Now, every year, it's like an avalanche. You're like, come up with a new idea, because this is not fun anymore. Yeah, yeah, They're, they are, you know, something something that the watch industry does well is uh, beat a dead horse, and they are doing that with vintage. Uh, you know, I say that after we just uh, talked up this really cool vintage uh, re-edition, but it's it's getting done today. There are still good examples of the genre. Absolutely. I don't want it to die because there are some advantages of vintage tributes: water resistance, warranty, the lack of you know the snake's Parts nest, you know counterfeiting, uh, Franken watches, misrepresentation. <laughs> you don't have to deal with any of that. So on that level, it's good. But when everyone does it, it's no longer cool. It's like in economics, the fallacy of composition. When every do everyone does the same thing to get ahead, it no longer works. And you know, I worry too about uh, the touching earlier the future of watches in general. I worry that uh, are the brands going to look into their history too often and only uh, only going into cyclical trends of the same watches over and over. And we're at a cool time in in watchmaking right now, where we have the apex of the history of watchmaking being paired with the modern technology going into it. So right now is a special time in watchmaking, and I mean right now is in the. This a, dec a decade yeah. ago and a decade forward. There's a lot to go. I just get worried about when brands do too many re-editions and where they're going to go with it. That's the one thing I like about Longa. They are openly a reconstituted brand, so they don't reach back into their past. Everything they do is in the spirit of the past without being literal. It's like Tom Gale, who was the design chief of Chrysler during the 90s, used to say, the Dodge Viper is a tribute to the Cobra. It's not a factory kit car. And that's the whole idea of heritage design done well. You can Capture the spirit of the thing without being literal. As soon as you get literal, you feel almost like a par it's almost a parody of the original. And that, I think, done excessively becomes a problem. Comment from Ian Chan in the box saying, I'm an existing long customer. This is on the Odysseus. And we speculated that you might have to buy a gold watch at list to get on that list. Well, he says, I'm an existing boutique customer. I have five longas. The boutique basically told me I need to get another longa one to get in good for the Odysseus. And to me, that's just wrong. I, I couldn't agree more. I, I'm not a fan of conditional selling at all. I also think, um, I also think the, the the Odysseus is going to be available. I think at first, like any new release, it's going to be a little bit tight. But I think as soon as people kind of, uh, you know, get their clutches on it, it will be almost instantaneous. It doesn't solve the underlying products or underlying problems that the brand has, which is too many watches, weak marketing, and. I would also say, frankly, an over-dependence on watches that have perhaps a niche appeal. Like, that particular Longa style is not universal. If you wanted to sell the greatest number to the masses, you would design watches that look a lot more 
mainstream. And there's nothing wrong with being a specialist and constraining your volume and staying true to the people who got you where you are. The problem is when you're a Richemont brand and the motto is ever upward and upward is defined solely in terms of the number of units you move. So you wind up with discounting, you wind up with deals where you have to buy another longer one to get the sports watch. And after the hot wears off the sports watch, then what happens? You're back to square one. Yeah, and and you know, the Longa in particular, they're known to discount up to 20% out of their boutiques uh, after the piece has been in production for a year or in distribution for a year. Now, I'm not sure how often that happens, but I often have personally ho heard stories of clients of mine getting it. And yet, if you ask me which brand do, do I revere the most? Of all the brands out there, I don't think anyone has achieved more since it was reestablished in 1994 from nothing than Langa. If I were to create a new collection around a theme, the theme would probably be Langa. I love the brand. I love the people who make the watches. I am that guy who likes that quirky, offbeat Saxon design. And I have to say that the Odysseus would look great on my wrist. I have nothing against it. Is it original? No. Is it a Langa? Absolutely. But the problem is going to be that Langa is still Langa with all the problems that existed pre-October 2019 as soon as the sports watch stops, I guess, drawing them along. And when you make 5,000 watches a year, how many of these Odysseus can you push to the market before problems That's begin? a good question because uh, Paddock uh, says the Nautilus in general uh, makes up about 25% of their percent of their production. And what is the Odysseus going to make up? It can't possibly make up 25% of Longa's production. No, and you gotta remember that Patek, you know, th they say 20% is steel, but most of that is the ladies 24. Yep. And that's the vast majority of their steel. Then you've got the Aquanaut, you've got the Nautilus, you've got occasional steel special editions. And not every Nautilus and Aquanaut is in steel. So you wind up asking how much of next year's longer production can be the Odysseus, and I, I guess the answer is going to really determine how they do for the year, but they either blow out the watch and sell it to everyone who makes an offer, and they lose the appeal of the piece, and the exclusivity's gone, or they string it along, and it does relatively little from an economic standpoint for them. I think their boutiques will conditionally sell the first wave. And then after that, I do think it will be infinitely available. Question from Mark S. How long are you going to bet before the Odysseus is available on the secondary market? Let's make that two questions. How long before you think they start appearing? And how long before they start appearing at less than list price? Well, you know, I think the first one that we see pre-owned is because of the environment we're living in, because of the climate of the market, it's going to trade for a premium, in my opinion. I don't think it will trade for less than list, the first one. The second, third through 10th, yeah, if I had to bet, I'd say, yeah, it's gonna be below list, but not very far. Eventually, as this craze levels out, probably over the next six months, if I were to, uh, if I were to bet on it, I think it will be available, low 20s, high teens. Yeah, it's, it's a 28.8 watch, 28,800 yep. US dollars. I'm willing to bet that by the time it reaches its one, its first birthday, you'll be able to get it at or below list on secondary markets. Yeah. So a question right here, this is a good question for you, Armin, because I'm not in sales and I have no idea how this works, but how do you ask an authorized dealer, how do I get on the list for any given steel sports watch. So a watch that you know is gonna have a wait list. How do you get on the list and what determines where you are on the list? Yeah, that's uh, an interesting question. You know, with the kind of hotter sports models trading at insane premiums, a lot of retailers have stopped taking names for their list and it's, it's kind of one of those difficult conversations that you have to have because effectively, if I sell you, let's just say, let's just go for the low hanging fruit. If I sell you a Daytona, who's, you know, turning around and flipping it is very, very, it looks very, very good for you because, you know, you're effectively, you have the potential of doubling your money. Um, so it's kind of this careful uh, skating that retailers have to do. You, of course, you want to get newer clients into pieces like that, and you want to be able to deliver pieces that people want. And right now, people want sports models. So the, the, Truth of the answer is maintain a relationship. Come come into your authorized dealer. Have a relationship with somebody at your store, at your local store, and or you know, give us a call. Call us up on the phone. Talk watches. Uh, you know, maybe maybe there's something else on your list that you're interested in buying. Maybe you just want to get on the list for a particular piece. But there's no harm in asking. It's a lot of times you will be politely, hopefully politely turned away. Um, 
And it's just because the demand is yeah. outrageous. A lot of times the dealers that'll show you the most respect will be honest about how long the wait is and just ask, do you want to get on the list? The list isn't like some hard and fast rule, but there's definitely a sense that beyond a reasonable waiting period, it's almost academic and they're not gonna they're not gonna kick you around and string you along. And I think it's best that if someone's gonna wait more than a year, you tell them that up front Absolutely. and then let them make the choice. And I think it becomes difficult too, especially when you have pieces that are, you know, like a, just a Nautilus, a 5711. You know, you have people telling people your, your list is eight years. We don't even know if the Nautilus, actually, I could say with almost not extreme certainty, but I would bet that the Nautilus won't be around for eight more years, or at least the 5711. Yeah, that, yeah. And Someone says eight years, that's basically them telling you no. off. No, yeah. So that's, I mean, yeah, it's still a very difficult conversation to have to have. Okay, so here's the thought. Is the bronze watch trend over? Is it is it going to be just a genre from now on? But are we past the peak? I, I can't imagine them going away altogether, but are we past the peak? Yes. Uh, uh, unequivocally, yeah, absolutely, yes. I think um, I think there are still some cool bronze pieces that are out there and that are coming out and being released, but I, I think we're seeing it a less, less and less demand for it in general. Um, and I don't think it's for any particular reason. I think what's going to happen eventually is bronze is going to be remembered as the two-tone of our age. It's going to be seen as people, from the perspective of people in the future, looking back on us, it's going to be seen as something that dates a watch badly to our immediate, temporally proximate period. So they're going to look at bronze the way we look at the 80s and 1990s Raymond Weil Parsifal and Cartier tanks Ouch. and you know Rolex Datejust two tones and they're going to look back on our bronze era and say that's a little bit gauche and they're going to say that's dated badly I'll wear it as a period piece if I'm in costume but I can't imagine it being mainstream in the future I think a big part of that too is the for the most part unwearable sizes I mean your 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 bronzos are 40, or 47, 44, uh, and, you know, your Tudor Black Bay Bronze is 43, and it wears just massively. So I think with the larger watch trend kind of getting a little bit more um, thrown by the wayside, the bronze trend is doing that as well. Yeah, I think it's going to be reduced to a niche. Let's, let's be honest. The PAM 382 is one of the all-time great designs. When I talk about after the Nautilus, what comes next, I'm hoping that a sea change watershed moment like the 382 comes along and pushes the industry in a different direction and away from 70s cliches. I don't <laughs> think we'll be that lucky, but I really do feel like we'll remember the first and the best bronze watches differently than we remember the Etcetarini that followed from every brand in every style at every price. I do think there will be better bronze watches to own going forward. I think so too. I agree with that. Eric Nielsen saying, IWC is quickly becoming Oldsmobile. Let's quickly unpack what that means and then evaluate. Oldsmobile, for those of you who are not Americans, was one of the roughly, uh, I, I think it was like one times like 10 to the 23rd General Motors brands back in the 20th century. And so it was one brand that was roughly in the middle with Cadillac at the top and at one point, I guess, Geo at the bottom. You had this huge like cradle to grave span of brands that were poorly differentiated. And the worst thing was in, by the 90s, they were all being built with the same engines and transmissions and platforms, leaving the stuff that was not well-defined like the Corvette or a major cash cow, like say Chevrolet as a brand, you wound up just seeing a bloodletting of brands that went away because they were redundant. And in the scope of a company with too many brands, they were the lowest, uh, shall we say, the lowest man on the totem pole that was swept away when inevitably the company started hemorrhaging cash. So IWC being one of many Richemont brands, presumably has way too much overlap with the likes of Panerai and JLC. And one might even say, in some regards, IWC overlaps with some of the higher end Bauman Mercier watches too, because you can get a $4,100 pilot. So IWC, Stuck between a rock and a hard place of the low end and the high end with sports watches that are duplicated by other brands. Are they the next Oldsmobile? <laughs> well, I think the one thing that IWC does better than anybody... Oh, that's bold. I don't even want to say that. Let's are say, pilots watches? Let's say they've got two bulletproof 
product lines. They've got the pilot and the Portuguese. Absolutely. I really feel like IWC should just be the pilot and the Portuguese and then a rotating cast of characters in a third model line that might be Aqua Timers for two years and then Portofinos for two years. And then if you must do a Da Vinci as a standalone, maybe a one year run. Like just make it something special so it feels like an occasion to get an IWC that's not a pilot or a Portuguese. Because frankly, Panerai is a sports watch. Yep. Panerai is the combat-inspired tactical brand, but Panerai can never persuasively do a pilot's watch. No. So let's try to figure out how these brands coexist and fit into the puzzle without everyone making everything at every price in every style. That is, I mean, that is the problem, is everybody is trying to make everything in their own regard. And, and I mean, you look at brands like IWC and you, you wonder what exactly are you really trying to accomplish because you have, you know, two different lines of dress pieces, okay? You have... I guess effectively three different lines of sports watches and they all encompass all different things. It's, you know, it's diving, it's racing, it's uh, pilots. The technician's watch, the, the ingenieur. <laughs> and it, they do the pilot's watch the best. You know, they, they have an affordable, really well put together. And if you go um, Mark 18 or even Pilot's Chrono, you know, your size is staying down. And even at 43, some of the Pilot's Chronos are a little bit larger, but you know, it's a pilot's watch. It's going to be a little bit larger. Uh, the big pilot is a legendary piece, and I couldn't wear that to save my life. No, but they should always have it in the catalog Absolutely. because it's an important model for them. It's 100%. So here's what I predict is going to happen, if I might. No, me. not at all. I think ultimately what you're going to see is a bloodletting at Richemont that involves not brands being cold, but you're going to see all of the back... Everything in the background, the business offices, the marketing, the staffing, everything but watchmaking is going to be centralized. So there will be one business office for marketing and planning all of these brands. And just like General Motors, where you would have basically one corporate center and everything would be planned from the center and, you know, the brands would represent whatever they represent. I think you're going to see more combination of the business side of these companies and less operational autonomy because why you need 12 separate business offices to attack a market that everyone understands is basically entry level to grand complications. There should be one office that figures out who's making what so they don't step on each other's toes but and spend the same dollar 12 times. I don't think that Richemont has that foresight, truthfully. I would hope that a group as large would, but honestly, you know, I think they keep multiple families and brands, and actually on a slightly different topic, uh, the amount of SKUs that brands have are is outrageous because it, they'll make it with several, you know, three different dials in two different metals on a bracelet or on a strap option, and each one's a different SKU. It's just too many if they if they cut it out. Uh, I think the reason that they do that is because you will have people that are IWC collectors, that are yes. Jaeger La Culture collectors. So, of course, if you're an IWC collector, you're going to want a dive watch. You're going to want a pilot's watch. Yeah, I, I absolutely want a Grand Copper address watch. And I think that's wherein we get into this problem with too many SKUs and uh, lack of a brand identity. The other thing that I'm seeing that's going to happen is IWC is going to go away from having one model line dominate each model year. They realized in 2007 that the Da Vinci was not strong enough to carry an entire model year and they got burned bad. So this year... There was talk that it might be an aqua timer year for the first time since 2014, and instead we got the pilot's watches for the second time since 2016. So what I think is that you'll see the rest of the model lines, the Ingenieur, the Portofino, and the aqua timer, uh, laid out mid-year as mid-year launches. Rather than ever having one year when they're all redesigned, you'll see them as occasional additions when IWC needs headlines, but doesn't quite want to roll out a new pilot. I honestly wouldn't mind that necessarily either. I think it would just... I, I think it would... It, again, if they cut SKUs, it might keep the product fresh, and I think it would. I think it would add excitement to the to the brand in general. And of course, everybody loves a mid year release, a fall release, a late winter release. It's so much fun, especially when you you know you have all your releases effectively in the first quarter. It's so much fun to see something later on and, and just unexpected. Yeah, I think that's definitely a fact, and it would help the company, maybe even paring down those lines so they seem rare and exceptional when they arrive. Uh, I see we've got some friends joining us from Malaysia, and I want to thank you for uh, getting up early with us. Uh, let's ask, let, let's conclude with something that I think is highly personal, has nothing to do with the market. Cost no object. What would your one watch for life be? Oh, I, I know the answer to this right off the bat, and I have, I have a feeling I'm going to get flack for it. Sure, go for it. 
cost no object, the watch that I would immediately pick, I really, really think would be a 116508 uh, yellow gold Daytona on a bracelet with a black dial um, and the gold subs. I just There's something about yellow gold that has always resonated with me, and there's something about the Daytona that has always resonated with me. And I think kind of gilding a classic like that is something that I just I just love, and um, I think the wearability every day gets me going too. And yeah, it's a little flashy, but money no option. I mean, yeah, I think if I were to go with just one, it'd be awfully hard to it would be awfully hard to say. I mean, I'm pretty damn close to being like just this one watch because this has been my watch for year after years of collecting multiple times per year. So the Zen Easy M1 one is basically my answer to the question, what would I do if I could just have one watch for life? But I think if I could have something that is, I think if I could have something that is just my one watch forever, it might be a Zeitwerk Lumen because I like having a Lumen watch. I love Longa and I really don't want to burn Longa this episode because while I have no commercial relationship with them, I adore the products of that company, and, and I really revere the watchmakers involved, like on a professional level like no one else. So the Zeitwerk Lumen would be a watch that I could use almost all the time everywhere I go while enjoying everything that I love about watches in that one watch. And I, I would also say it would be the fulfillment of a grail for me, because I've always imagined a Zeitwerk on my wrist and I don't think I'd ever get tired of it. And as a skinny guy who freezes quickly, I wouldn't miss swimming with it. I, I don't need that. So yeah. that's my answer. I think it'd be a Zeitwerk Lumen forever. I think that's cool. That's a cool pick. All right, guys. And if you ask, what would I buy if it weren't the Zinn and the Zeitwerk Lumen? Probably the MIH watch, if I'm budget constrained. <laughs> All right, guys. Thank you so much for joining in. I am gone for basically a month. I'll be back in December. I will make sure someone is holding down the fort here every Monday. We have a pop-up shop in Geneva right next to the Hotel de Berg. It is going to be Watchbox Switzerland. It's being run out of Switzerland, so this is our Swiss inventory. The best pieces from Jorn, Patek Philippe, Rolex, and small independents, revered brands at Iceberg, Place de Berg, Trois. Be there or be square. <laughs> Armand, thank you very much for Tim, joining me Thank today. you for having me, always a pleasure. Armand will return like James Bond. Thanks to you, thanks to my crew, thanks to Armand, time out, Tim out, thanks for logging on.